Hey guys, this is Mr. Roxy coming at you live from West Palm Beach in Florida. It is Tuesday. Today is March the 2nd. Can you believe it's already March? And, uh, you know, every single day that goes by, I'm surprised by how little I know. In this particular instance, um, when people start talking about hedges and costless colors, I realize I'm out of my depth. And I thought we we're going to take a little bit of time to sort of explore this and talk about it uh, in a little bit more detail because. Uh, I didn't know the answers to some of your questions, so I did what uh, any uh, rational, logical person would do, and I asked Occidental Investor Relations to help me out and explain the concepts to me. So let me get this uh, presentation up, and um, we'll uh, have a quick discussion about um, Occidental's costless collars and hedges, and um, kind of see if we can make heads or tails as to... Uh, how this work and what is going on. So stick with me here for just a few minutes and I'm gonna try and explain it as best I can using the information provided to me by Occidental Investor Relations. In other words, hey, you know what? If you don't know the answer, ask, ask someone smarter than what you are. And that includes probably most of you. So the first thing that happened is in the uh, last video that I made, which was uh, sort of an overview of Occidental's fourth quarter earnings, um, I went into the analyst Q&A session at the end of the investor call. And uh, during that call, Raphael Dubois from Société Générale uh, asked about the hedging for crude oil. And Rob Peterson, who's the uh, chief financial officer for Occidental, replied and he said, historically, Oxy is not regularly engaged in hedging. But we did, to your point, with our increased, le increased leverage, in other words, from before, take out an oil hedge in 2020, as in last year, that had a collar in 2020. And then we, and then it also had a call provision in 2021. So this year we have a call provision. So the only thing remaining from that oil hedge, Rob Peterson said, is the call provision in 2021. Right at the bottom in the highlight here, you probably may not even be able to see it. It says, we evaluate the cost of doing so versus the uh, not doing so. Obviously there is risk and reward. Hedges and collars and costless collars, uh, well not costless collars, but hedges and collars cost money, um, which means there's an expense that you can incur. And if you don't do it, you, the, you incur the risk of a commodity price that might do you harm. So anyway, uh, as I said, people ask questions about this, including Lee Sin, who's just one of the people I highlighted. Three days ago, he wrote me and said, hello, Mr. Oxy. Do you know what does call provision mean for the 2021 hedge? I believe the 2020 collar means they have a cap on the realized oil price. By the way, is this WTI or Brent? And what is this call provision? What does it mean for 2021? And as I usually do, uh, unless I get into a mindset of uh, ready, fire, aim. In this case, what I did was I said, I'm ready, I'll aim and uh, took aim at investor relations and said, please help me out guys. And then I fired. So here's the response basically. So investor relations said, I can refer back to the slide. And this particular slide comes from the Q3 2020 earnings presentation, which obviously you can look up and you can find for yourself, but here's the actual reply. So they said for our 2020 hedge, to achieve the costless structure, we sold a 2020 put. Now, just by way of uh, reference um, for people who get confused between puts and calls, um, the way I remember sort of broadly speaking or at a high level, the difference between the two is that you call your broker to place a trade and you put something on sale. So when you call, it's kind of uh, typically a buy and a put would be a sell. The 2021 call remains in place this year, meaning that we have a 350 million barrels of oil with an effective ceiling price of $74.16 Brent. It's fair to say that we would be in a strong place today if Brent were to average above that price. This is certainly possible because we have seen Brent rise into the early 60s and mid 60s uh, just over the recent couple of uh, most recent couple of weeks. So um, the ceiling price of around 74.16 is not too far off. And then during the call, Rob was making the point that to Im implement a similar costless hedge for 2021, we may have to sell a call that extends through 2022. Given the, given the recent run-up in oil prices, 
we would need to carefully weigh the pros and cons of doing so, especially as we have reduced our short-term risk with the debt reduction and refinancing, uh, which has been taking place over the last almost now one year. We could also buy a put, which is a pure put without selling an offsetting put or call. A pure put would not be costless, so uh, these are just things that, uh, that they need to do in terms of hedging their, uh, their risk. And as I said uh, a minute ago, and you can see this right at the bottom of the page, says putting a pure put in place would be expensive uh, depending on the curve uh, uh, in terms of the commodity price. So that's kind of the first part of it because he broke it down into two. That's the oil hedge. Then the next one is the gas hedge. The gas hedge is a, a costless structure, but more straightforward. Um, as basically the put and the call only extends through 2021. And then again, you have a slide that you can refer to here from their um, uh, Q4 2020 earnings presentation, which obviously you can look up. A quick look at Occidental today, and we see that Occidental is in a reasonably uh, good position. It's up a few pennies today, trading at around $28. Uh, you can see the uh, sort of um, little... Uh, a uh, graph here on the side, which is the past three months for Occidental, which has rewarded us uh, well for being patient and sticking with Occidental. And one of my friends actually just wrote me and said uh, he missed the um, the uptick from seven dollars to uh, to twenty eight. Um, hey, you know what? Uh, even at twenty eight dollars, uh, Occidental is still trading kind of at half of what it was trading at uh, sort of a year and a bit ago before the pandemic. So I'm not suggesting we're going from 28 to 56, and I'm certainly not suggesting that that may happen soon, if it happens at all, uh, but certainly at $28 Occidental with a market cap of $26 billion is arguably still undervalued and grossly so. Um, another comment here. So I had some conversations with Yidi and Yidi has been, uh, sorry, Dr. Yidi has been doing uh, a whole variety of mathematical calculations and equations uh, calculating how much uh, free cash flow Occidental will have for this year. Uh, he said, uh, you suggested a $3 billion debt reduction. They'll have 5 to $7 billion in cash left. What do they do with this massive amount of cash? Uh, they will need some of the cash for debt refinance. And I said, how about an acquisition maybe? And I refer you back to Vicky's notes during the conference call. This blue highlight here in the red circle says, we frequently complete acreage trades to core up positions in, in operatorships, Oper operatorship. And on occasion, we may pursue opportunities where we see outstanding value with the bolt on acquisition. So in other words, having free cash flow uh, is a good thing uh, in a variety of different ways, including potentially some bolt on acquisitions. Uh, so we'll have to see where they go with that. Um, but there is no question that at the current prices of WTI and Brent, Occidental is generating a significant amount of free cash flow. And then just finally, I'm going to wrap it up uh, with this on, you know, when in doubt and you don't know where to go, you can always go to market beat for some uh, daily entertainment. Um, you know, in their defense, they uh, sort of act as, as uh, a resource, uh, quoting a whole number of different analysts, schmanalysts and all that kind of stuff. But this highlighted section that I have here at the bottom kind of illustrates uh, the point to you as to why I'm always talking about the analysts uh, and calling them analysts at the same time. Truist raised their target price on the shares of Occidental Petroleum from $11 to $25 in a research note on January the 21st. UBS cut shares of Occidental from neutral to sell and increased their price objective for the company from $10 to $12 on Tuesday. Well done, UBS. Maybe you guys should consider learning how to code. Bank of America increased their price objective on shares of Occidental Petroleum from $29 to $31. That one kind of looks more realistic by Bank of America Merrill Lynch and gave the company a buy rating in a report on Monday. Uh, maybe it's just my personal bias, but I like that one a lot more than the two immediately above. MKM Partners cut shares of Occidental Premium from buy to neutral in a report on Monday, December 7th. So now we're going a little bit back in history, but even Barclays uh, increased their price objective on the shares of Occidental 
from 18 to 23 dollars per share gave the company equal weight and that was on january the 14th uh, right now five research analysts have rated the stock with a sell rating 10 have assigned it a hold rating and 10 have given it a buy rating make of that whatever you wish analyst analyst all of this is completely meaningless and my apologies for sharing that drivel with you but on a much lighter note I will wrap it up here and say that's the stock market for you and that's the ride and just because it rhymes I'm going to say the ride subscribe if you like my content hit the subscribe button and uh, let's build this community of like-minded investors looking to achieve long-term generational wealth on that happy note this is uh, Rudy for Bester Investor signing off saying goodbye take care and uh, have yourself a great trading day whatever it is that you're doing bye-bye